Glad to be here with you. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to um, direct your attention again to the Revival and Reformation website. I'm sure you're familiar with this, but we've done a whole new revamping of the website and have a lot of um, new resources available. If you look under resources tabs, hundreds of new resources that are going up there. A lot of things that can help um, church members all over. We are so distracted. And that's why I think our greatest need, which I know you're familiar with this, but we're going to look at this briefly, is a revival of true godliness among us. This is the most greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our second work, third work, fourth work, first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to give his blessing, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which He's promised to give us His blessing. Here we see that the only way to receive the Holy Spirit is if we learn to live a lifestyle of genuine humility. Uh, now, this afternoon in the time that I have with you, I could elabor elaborate upon the wonderful characteristics of genuine humility and surrender. Or I could challenge you to greater humility and surrender. And the latter is what I'm going to do um, today. So before I begin, let's just bow our heads for a brief word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, I just thank you for this group here in this room and the work that they are doing all around the world. Right now, Heavenly Father, I'm just asking for an extra measure of your Holy Spirit to be poured out here right now. I know people are tired and weary. It's been a long day. We're distracted with many things and many good things. But Father, we need to refocus our hearts and minds on you. And I just ask that you would speak through me, that you would give me your words and that you would be glorified. Father, I ask that we would not leave this room the same way that we walked into this room this afternoon. Please, Father, change our hearts, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. One of the things that I'm the most passionate about talking about is the key. You might say, what is the key? The key is prayer. We're told prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse where I treasure the boundless resources of omnipotence. This is the key. And so I love talking about prayer, prayer founded upon the word, faith, faith founded upon the word. And one of my favorite passages, which I know is one of your favorite passages too, comes from Malachi 3.10, which says, Prove me and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Of course, that's in the context of the tithes and offerings. But this verse is not limited to tithes and offerings. This is what God wants to do in every area of our lives. You know, we know uh, the children of Israel were called out of the land of Egypt. But were they called out of Egypt to set up housekeeping in the wilderness? Was that God's intent for them? Was that God's intent for the children of Israel to stay in the wilderness? No. His intent was to take them to the promised land. And I believe that that's his intent for us today as well. But unfortunately, many Christians, and I would maybe even say even most Christians, are actually just barely surviving uh, spiritually. The fact is, is we get camped in the wilderness. And we don't even realize we're camped in the wilderness because the problem is everyone else is around us as well. This quote really um, impacted me years ago, Councils for the Church. It says, most professed Christians have no sense of the spiritual strength they might obtain were they as ambitious, zealous, and persevering to gain a knowledge of divine things as they are to obtain the perishable things of this life. Many are satisfied to be spiritual dwarfs. Thus, many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They make no earnest effort and therefore they will be weighed in the balances 
and found wanting. Just, just briefly, uh, a little recap on my story. I was raised in the Seventh-day Adventist Church of the lukewarm uh, Laodicea of the modern West. And uh, that's what I grew up in. And I saw things around me. I wasn't really that attracted to what I saw in the church. And honestly, it's a miracle that I stayed in the church um, growing up here in North America. But um, God kept me in and I got busy doing uh, many things. I knew I was supposed to serve God and I wanted to serve him. I didn't really know exactly how, but I started working in ministry uh, at a young age. Uh, from high school on into my college years, got involved with missions and started traveling here and there around the world. Um, but there was something missing and I didn't really understand what it was. Um, the reality was is I was living a superficial wilderness experience. And it was actually about 10 years ago, um, after going through some really difficult experiences, that God got a hold of my heart and convicted me. I have so much more for you. Why are you settling? Dare to ask for more. And that's when I really started getting on my knees and pleading, Lord, I don't know what it looks like, but I know that I don't have what I need. I need a deeper experience with you. I need a deeper walk with you. I'm going to see you working in my life in answer to prayer. I mean, are you the same God that lived during the wilderness that brought the children of Israel out of the Red Sea? Or have you changed? What's wrong? And so I started praying and pleading, and my life began to drastically change. And I don't have time to share all of that testimony here, but it's just been an amazing adventure since then. You know, we're told that, that He comes that we might have life and life more abundant, but we know who wants to rob us of this life. The first part of the verse says, the enemy comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but He comes that we might have life and life more abundant. Now, I know I'm talking to stewardship um, department directors from around the world, and I was looking up a little bit more behind what the stand you, you all stand for as a group, and on the website I see that stewards are created to be images of God and to represent His interest, to be a living image. Stewards must mirror God's love, character, and purpose. And I thought, wow, this is powerful. What does it mean? to actually do these things. So we're going to talk about this. And unfortunately, I feel like there's a discrepancy in our church uh, as a whole. You know, we are all called to be stewards. That there's a discrepancy in our lives um, about really mirroring God's love, demonstrating what He's like, and being, living up to what you, you talk about a steward should be. And a big part of this discrepancy, I believe, has to do with breaches in our lives or, or ways the enemy is attacking us, that is pulling us down. And these are things that are keeping us in the wilderness spiritually. I'm just going to look at these really briefly. Here's some spiritual breaches. Um, unconfessed sin, idols, addictions, ungodly mindsets, conversations, ungodly behaviors, um, satanic strongholds, sins of omission. You can see uh, the list here, and I talk about this a lot more in detail uh, in, in my book, Daring to Ask. But I want to touch on just a couple here briefly. Satanic strongholds, you may think, well, this, I mean, this doesn't really so much apply to us, and hopefully it doesn't. But I have a missionary, uh, I have a friend that's a missionary in South America, and he was actually riding on a bus, um, traveling from one village to another over the mountains, and he discovered he was sitting next to this kind of magic witch doctor type person on the bus. And the man started boasting to him about the different things that he could do. And, and he told my friend, he says, you know, if you wanted, I could cast a spell over your family and I could cause your wife to leave you and I could bring you the woman of your dreams. And he's like, uh, no, I don't think you could do that. <laughs> And the man says, no, I could. And no, you couldn't do that. You, no, let me ask you some questions. I, I, I could. And so he starts asking him some questions. Um, do you do such and such and some type of activity, uh, worldly activity of the region? Do you listen to such and such? And he listed some popular um, music programs of the region. Do you watch such and such? And he listed some popular television. And of course, my friend kept saying, no, no, no. Um, he, he's like, do you watch soap operas? <laughs> he's like, no. He says, do you look at pornography? And he says, no. And he kept going through this list. And at the end, he says, you're right. I can't touch you. But the moment that you partake in any one of those ac activities, I can exercise all the power in the world over you because you have given me a foothold into your life. Mm. 
We do not realize how our little compromises with the things of the world around us actually give the enemy a foothold into our life and he begins to make breaches and breaches begin to break down things in our lives. One of the biggest breaches that we struggle with is ungodly mindsets. I read this book a while back called Respectable Sins, Confronting the Sins That We Tolerate by a man named Jerry Bridges. This was very eye-opening to me. Look at some of the sins that we tolerate. Anxiety, frustration, discontentment, unthankfulness, a judgmental spirit, backbiting, pride, selfishness, lack of self-control, impatience, anger, jealousy, envy, the list goes on. You know, we think, well, how can we speak against these things? After all, we all struggle with them, right? So who's going to preach against this? Because I struggle with it, you struggle with it, we all struggle with it. But that does not make it right. As we look through God's Word, there are actually many um, verses and promises in God's Word that are sharing how to get the victory over these sins. You know, one of the reasons, that specifically pride and selfishness, um, are such a problem. Look at this. However trifling this or that wrong act may seem in the eyes of men, no sin is small in the sight of God. Man's judgment is partial and perfect, but God estimates all things as they really are. The drunkard is despised and told that his sin will exclude him from heaven, while pride, selfishness, covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these sins are especially offensive to God for their contrary to the benevolence of his character and to the unselfish love, which is the atmosphere of the unfallen universe. He who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of his shame and poverty and his need of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need. And this is why it's so deadly, because it shuts us out um, from God. We're told our only claim to his mercy is our great need. You know, if you look at the reality of what we're called to as Christians, we are called to live an impossible life. How are we supposed to reflect Christ? How are we supposed to have that supernatural love? How are we supposed to turn the other cheek when we're slapped? You know, these are things we cannot do. But if we will recognize our need and fall broken upon Him, He says, I, through, through me, you can do all things. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. And this is what He's calling for, is us to be broken upon Him. I just want to share a story about a man uh, that I, may, uh, I met in uh, Southeast Asia. I'm calling his name Phil. And he's a Bible worker working with a church planting there. And I was interviewing him um, while I was there. And he told me an interesting story. Evidently, he and his wife had been on a motorcycle um, and they had stopped beside the road to buy something. And another motorcycle came along and hit them, ran into them. And the man was drunk that hit them. And they didn't quite know how to relate. Thankfully, no one was too seriously injured, um, just some minor um, cuts and bruises. But anyway, he, he started talking to the drunk man and he asked him, what, what do you want me to do? Well, why is he asking him that? I mean, he wasn't the one that hit him. The drunk man hit, right? But he's asking the man who hit him, what do you want me to do? And the man says, well, you need to pay for the damages and whatever. And so he says, okay, I, I will. And he paid for the damages, but he not only did that, he went to the man's home uh, where he lived. It was a adjoining village a little ways away. And he came and he started helping this man, who turned out, incidentally, he didn't know it at the time, to be the chief of the next village over. And he starts working with him and helping him plow his field and making friends with the family. And the villagers began to question him and say, what are you doing? I mean, our chief is not a nice man. He's, he's a rude man. Why are you trying to be nice to him? And he just basically said to the effect, because I love Jesus and I want to share Jesus' love. Obviously, he needs it, <laughs> right? And so he did this. And you know, that began to soften the hearts in this village. And people began to say, I want to know more about this Jesus that could make somebody act like this. 
and he had actually been trying to get a foothold in that village previously and he had not been able to um, but because of what happened with this and how he reacted which is amazing I mean who would re respond this way he got a foothold into that village and began to give Bible studies and when I talked to him he already had a group preparing for baptism Amen. it was amazing Amen. you know we are told that the Lord can do more in one hour than we can do in a whole lifetime. And when he sees that his people are fully consecrated, let me tell you, a great work will be done in a short time. And the message of truth will be carried into the dark places of the earth where it has never been proclaimed. But what is holding us back from being fully consecrated? What is keeping us from being the stewards that we are called to be? It's lack of surrender. It is love of self. We cannot afford to let our spirits chafe over any real or supposed wrong done to ourselves. We're told self is the enemy that we most need to fear. No other victory we can gain will be so precious as the victory gained over self. We should not allow our feelings to be easily wounded. We are to live, catch this, we are to live not to guard our feelings or our reputations, but to save souls. This is why we are to live. You know, I remember when I first went on my first mission trip um, years ago back when I was in high school and seeing these idols and everyone worshiping and thinking, how can people worship these things? And, and then I've come to realize in the years since, especially um, the last few years as, as God's been growing my own walk and life with Him, the idols that we struggle with are even bigger than those golden statues across the seas that we can't understand uh, how people worship. Whatever we cherish that tends to lessen our love for God or interfere with the service due Him, of that do we make a God. Idolatry exists in the churchgoers today as verily as in the days of Noah. Oh, that you would search your hearts as with a lighted candle and discover and break the finest threads that binds you to worldly habits which divert the mind from God. We have our darling idols, as she calls them, and our cherished sins that it's so hard to give up. She says, raise up and send forth messengers in whose heart self-idolatry, which lies at the foundation of sin, has been crucified. This is our greatest struggle. You know, there are two places that we can live today, and every one of you in this room is living in one of these two places. We have only two choices. One is we are living on the throne and I'm in charge of my life and how things go and I'm choosing and or we are on the cross. Self is on the cross as we um, crucified with Christ. If self is on the throne, Christ is actually on the cross being crucified afresh. God cannot occupy a divided heart or reign from a divided throne. In fact, we're told every rival that holds the affections uh, from God must be dethroned. God has bought us. He claims a throne in our heart. There can be no halfway work. I want to share something, and maybe you can get this passing around the table to everyone. Thank you. I want to share something practical to make this, to help, help this come more down to earth and home. What does it mean to die to self practically in our everyday life? I'm going to start reading here. Dying to self. When you are forgotten or neglected or purposefully said it not, and you don't sting and hurt with the insult or the oversight, but your heart is still happy being counted worthy to suffer for Christ, that is dying to self. Yeah, that, that's awesome if you want to repeat that with me when I get to that part. When your good is evil spoken of, when your wishes are crossed, your advice disregarded, your opinions ridiculed, your best intentions misinterpreted, and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart or even defend yourself, but rather take it all in patient, loving silence, knowing that Christ alone is your defender, that is dying to self. When you patiently bear annoyance, disorder, inconvenience, irregularity, and even impunctuality from others, when you feel your time has been wasted and you've been treated harshly and unfairly, 
and yet you still respond in love, maintaining your peace and enduring these things with meekness as Jesus endured. That is dying to self. When you are unruffled with less than desirable accommodations, uncomplaining with meager food, difficult climates, rearranged travel schedules, I know this is not easy, when you maintain cheerfulness even though others are grumpy, when you are loving, kind, and attentive even to those who can do you no benefit by their association, when you remain calm despite interruptions to your agenda and plans by the will of God, that is dying to self. When you don't care to refer to yourself in conversation, when you don't feel the need to boast of your accomplishments and record every good deed for the world to see, when you don't itch after commendation and applause, when you don't mind when others are acknowledged and your name is ignored, when you're more concerned with being faithful to God's call, when it's okay to be unknown, that is dying to self. When you see your brother prospering, when you see him succeeding with a project that maybe you contributed to and yet you can honestly rejoice with him in spirit, being happy to re remain behind the scenes, not questioning God, but being grateful that the work is being accomplished so that God is glorified, that is dying to self. When you receive correction and reproof from one of lesser stature than yourself and can humbly submit inwardly as well as outwardly, finding no rebellion or resentment rising up within your heart, that is dying to self. In these last days, the Spirit must bring us to the cross if we would be saved. Once we die on the cross, we will not respond to any slights against our human flesh any longer because dead people don't move. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but that's terribly convicting to my heart when I see all the times I'm not <laughs> dying to self and people poke and prod and I jump. And, and the Holy Spirit is like, are you trusting me you're not dying you think you have to defend you think you have to fight you know we're told many will receive applause for virtues which they do not possess the searcher of hearts weighs the motives often deeds that are highly applauded by men and recorded by him as springing from recorded by men as springing from selfishness and base hypocrisy applauded by men and recorded by him, sorry, as springing from selfishness and base hypocrisy, every act of our lives, whether excellent and praiseworthy or deserving of censure, is judged by the searcher of hearts according to the motives which prompted it. What I'm trying to help us do is get out of the box and under um, where we usually look when we're talking about surrender and dying to self. You know, it's really hard um, when you work in ministry because there's a tendency, especially as you have success, um, to lose that sweet humility that you had in the beginning. And look at Saul. We see what happened with Saul and others in the Bible who lost. And I just really want to, to challenge us as, as I'm sharing this morning or this, this afternoon. <laughs> um, our ministry is not a stage to display ourselves. This is not why I'm here. This is not why each one of you have been called into the positions. Obviously, God has blessed you. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been called to the leadership that you're in. But we have to ever keep in mind, this is not about us. The object of all ministry is to keep self out of sight and to let Christ appear. A friend of mine has this little plaque. And I think it's so powerful. It says there's no limit to what a man can do or where he can go. If he doesn't mind, who gets the credit? <laughs> Imagine where we can go and what we can do. You know, in the whole realm of things, who cares who gets the credit as long as the job gets done and Jesus returns? Why do we so jealously guard our territory? Why are we so protective of our rights, our name, our work, our reputation? When we get to heaven, are we going to be arguing about who got the credit for something that happened on earth? No, we're going to realize that the only one worthy of any praise, any credit, is Jesus Christ. He is the only one. So basically, back to this where we live, the evidence of where we live is how we bleed. And when I talk about that, um, what do I mean? What do I mean? Think about Christ when he was on the cross. 
What did he bleed when he was cut and pierced? He bled scripture, he bled compassion, he bled love, he bled mercy. When we are cut and pierced by others, what do we bleed? You know, most of us want to be known as unselfish servants of the Lord. That is until we start getting treated like servants. <laughs> then we change our minds because self has never been fully crucified. It's pretending to be dead, but you poke it and prod it, it comes back to life. That's why again and again we see the, the call throughout scripture and um, inspiration as well. Crucify self. Self is the greatest enemy that we have to fear. Crucify self. In place, and this quote says, in place of seeking to crucify the brethren, in place of seeking to crucify others, in place of seeking to crucify your spouse or your children or your co-workers, self is what needs to die. Self is what has to go to the cross. There are so many struggles that we all have, and I know we all do because we're all human. Uh, self in our thinking patterns, our communication habits, you know. Um, think about how you communicate with people. Are you always looking to defend or, or to stand for how you look, what your, um, what your reputation is, uh, how you come across? I know I struggle with this. Just two days ago, I was communicating with a coworker here in this building uh, about something, and they asked me why something hadn't been done a certain way. And I gave them the answer that was easiest to give and that actually made me look the best. And I didn't bother to explain that there were some more complicating issues. Well, I didn't have to share those complicating issues with them, but what I actually told them was not the truth. It was a lie. And I was convicted after I said that. It's like I said this and then the Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart like Melody. You know, that's not the truth what you just said. I mean, you might think, well, it's just kind of a white lie. It's just kind of smoothing things over because after all, you know, they don't need to tear the whole story and they don't. But think about how we communicate with others. Are we trying to protect our reputation? Are we trying to protect ourselves? I struggle with this. We struggle in self with relationships. I think it's interesting. Ellen White says if five minutes, uh, if pride and selfishness were removed, five minutes would solve most problems in relationships. Wow. In our ministry, in our appetites, I have really struggled, and, and I know we, we struggle in these areas too, in, in the area of appetite. And I uh, struggle off and on with the beautiful thing called sugar. I'm sure none of you struggle with that. <laughs> but anyway, I was in Romania um, preaching an evangelistic series as part of the TMI uh, group this last spring, and someone had given us these chocolate croissants, and they were so good. And I saw them in the store and I'm like, I want to take back some, take them home with me so I can enjoy some more. And so I did and I got home with these chocolate croissants and I was really convicted because I had been, I had been praying, Lord, please help me to surrender in this area and not just eat whatever I want when I feel like it, but help me to be surrendered in this area. So I had been praying that God would help me. And then I do this, and it's, it's not like eating chocolate croissants is a sin. I'm just sharing an illustration of a struggle that I had. And, and I was convicted, why did I bring these home with me? Have you ever done that? You, know, you, you bring some snack into the house, and you're like, why did I bring that home with me? Oh, I don't need this temptation in the house. So I began struggling with this in my mind, and I'm struggling with it over the course of days and over the course of a week. And I'm like, I want to eat this chocolate croissant, but I'm like convicted that I shouldn't be eating it. And so I'm going back and forth. And then I just told myself, well, you know what? I can solve this problem really quick because if I just eat the chocolate croissant, I'm not going to be tempted anymore. <laughs> and then I'll be all done. And so that's what I did. I went and opened it and I ate it. And then I set the wrapper down on the floor and, um, and it's like sweet in the mouth and bitter in the belly. <laughs> And I'm like, why did I do that? And the ironic thing is when I set this thing down on the floor, I set it right on these quotes on dying to self and surrender because I was actually searching the topic. And it's like, look at the irony here. And I'm like, Lord, I know this is not necessarily the end of my whatever, but it's just look at what you're showing me this uh, in my struggle. 
you know, I, I hesitate to share this, but this quote has been so, um, so convicting to me. And I know this steps on all of our toes, and I want you to know that it steps on mine just as much as yours. But we're told the controlling power of the appetite will prove the ruin of thousands when, if they had conquered on this point, on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. Wow, amazing. Um, and I see why the first test was in that area. But I wanna encourage you. I have struggles just like you do, and I know you probably have even greater struggles serving on the front lines of ministry that you do, um, because we're told the enemy is actually attacking those in leadership positions especially hard. Um, so if you're feeling that attack spiritually in different ways, it's because um, you're where you're supposed to be and God is working and, he's, and the enemy is trying to stop that. But Jesus sympathizes with the weakness of men. He came to earth that he might bring us moral power. However strong the passion or appetite, we can gain the victory. We may have divine strength to unite with our feeble efforts. Those who flee to Christ will have a stronghold in the day of temptation. You know, we're, we know that this is an ongoing struggle, an ongoing um, battle that we're going to have. As long as Satan reigns, we're going to have self to subdue, besetting sins to overcome. As long as life shall last, there's not going to be a stopping place where we can reach and say, I have fully attained. Sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. But I love this. With watchfulness and prayer, our weakest points can be so guarded that they can become our strongest points and we can em encounter temptation without being overcome. He wants to give us a victory in these areas. You know, I, t I shared those thought, uh, those struggles that we have in our thought and our communication and all of those things. He wants to give us a victory in these areas. And something that has just totally um, changed and added a whole new dimension to my life, and I'm not really gonna get into it now here, but is the whole concept of praying the Word of God. This is what has taken uh, my walk with God to a new level in my prayer life because I'm just opening the scriptures and I'm praying these back to Him. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm struggling in this. I do not know how to get the victory. I need you to help me. And I start claiming the promises and I cry the promises and I've wrestled. And there is power in His Word. There is power in His Word. He says His Word does not return onto him void. And so that has just made a huge difference uh, between praying the word and prayer and growing. Um, I also included in that handout um, a vision that Ellen White had, and I'm actually going to close with this, and then we'll have a brief time of prayer. Um, I found a little while back and just so, so convicting. And it's a dream that she had about a sentinel or a guard at a door. It, she was attending actually a camp meeting in Australia and God was really working. But during that camp meeting, she spoke and shared a dream that God had given her. And this is the dream. And this is for us today. In my dream, a sentinel stood at the door of an important building and asked everyone who came for entrance, have you received the Holy Ghost? A measuring line was in his hand, and only very, very few were admitted into the building. Your size as a human being is nothing, he said, but if you have reached the full stature of a man in Christ Jesus, according to the knowledge you have had, you will receive an appointment to sit with Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and through the eternal ages you will never cease to learn of the blessings granted and the banquet prepared for you. You may be tall and well-proportioned in self, but you cannot enter here. None can enter who are grown up children carrying with them the disposition, the habits, the characteristics which pertain to children. If you've nurtured suspicions, criticisms, temper, self-dignity, you cannot be admitted for you would spoil the feast. All who go in through the store have on the wedding garment woven in the loom of heaven. This is the key. This is where we have our hope in this wedding garment. Those who educate themselves to pick flaws in the character of others, reveal a deformity that makes families unhappy, that turns souls from the truth to choose fables. Your leaven of distrust, your want of confidence, your power of accusing, 
closes against you the door of admittance. Within this door, nothing can enter that could possibly mar the happiness of the dwellers by marring their perfect trust in one another. You cannot join the happy family in the heavenly courts, for I have wiped all tears from their eyes. You can never see the king in his beauty if you are not yourself a representative of his character. And what are you called to be as stewards and leaders in stewardship ministry? Representatives of his character, mirrors of the image of God. When you give up your own will, your own wisdom, and learn of Christ, you will find admittance into the kingdom of God. He requires entire, unreserved surrender. Give up your life for him to order, mold, and fashion. Take upon you your neck his yoke. Submit to be taught and led by him. Learn that unless you become as a little child, you can never enter the kingdom of heaven. Abiding in Christ is choosing only the disposition of Christ so that his interests are identified with yours. Abide in him to be and to do only what he wills. These are the conditions of discipleship, and unless they are complied with, you can never find rest. Rest is in Christ. It cannot be apart from him. The moment his yoke is adjusted to your neck, that moment it is found easy. Then the heaviest spiritual labor can be performed, the heaviest burdens borne, because the Lord gives the strength and the power, and he gives gladness in doing the work. Mark the points. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Who is it that speaks? The majesty of heaven, the king of glory. He desires that your conception of spiritual things shall be purified from the dross of selfishness, the defilement of a crooked, coarse, unsympathetic nature. You must have an inward, higher experience. You must obtain a growth in grace by abiding in Christ. When you are converted, you will not be a hindrance, but will strengthen your brethren. I was just reading yesterday as part of my devotions, Luke 21, where Jesus is talking to Peter. And he says, you know, the devil's trying to try you and sift you. I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. But when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. And how Peter went through this whole change. You know, he's working for God. He thought he was on the right track. And how he had to come to that humility where he actually betrayed Christ and recognized his own weakness before God could truly use them. She says, all these words were spoken in my dream. I saw that some turned sadly away and mingled with the scoffers. Others with tears all broken in heart made confession to those whom they had bruised and wounded. They did not think of maintaining their own dig dignity, but asked at every step, what must I do to be saved? The answer was, repent and be converted that your sins may be go, go beforehand to the judgment and be blotted out. Words were spoken which rebuked spiritual pride. This God will not tolerate. It is inconsistent with his word and with our profession of faith. Seek the Lord, all ye who are ministers of his. Seek him while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The reality is, as I said, there's two places that we can live. We, we are either staying on the cross, crucified with Christ, or we are on the throne. And there are only two places where God dwells. One is in the high and holy place, and one is with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit. That's why the only way that we can uh, ever have that above and beyond humility and surrender that he's calling us to, which we do not have the ability to have in our own strength, the only way we can have that is if we stay at the foot of the cross.